Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Historicalish. This is the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg Explained, Volume 3, Episode 2. If you enjoy watching these and you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button and you can go check out the Volume 1 and Volume 2 full length videos on my profile. But I will stop badgering you and jump right in. Number 11, Pithom. Pithom is referenced in the biblical Exodus narrative as one of the store cities built by the Israelites under Egyptian bondage, and it's a site of great historical and archaeological debate. The quest to identify Pithom has led scholars and archaeologists to various locations within Egypt, with Tel el Maskuta in the eastern Nile Delta being the most widely accepted site. However, the identification and understanding of Pithom are not without its controversy and encompasses a wide range of theories and interpretations that delve into Egyptology, biblical studies, and historical geography. Pithom is thought to derive from the Egyptian Per Atum or House of Atum, indicating a temple or a cultic site dedicated to the deity Atum. The site believed to correspond to Pithom Tel El Mascuta lies near the modern day Suez Canal and reflects the strategic importance in ancient times, particularly for controlling the waterways connected to the Nile and the Red Sea. So, to get the primary candidate Tel El Mascuta out of the way, excavations at this place has unveiled a settlement with features characteristic of the Ramasad period of the New Kingdom, which aligns with the biblical timeline of Exodus. Notably, the site contains storage facilities and a temple dedicated to Atum, supporting its identification as a logistical and religious center. And like I mentioned previously, the proximity to ancient trade routes and its location along the canal, which links the Nile and the Red Sea, do underscore the importance for trade, military, and administrative activities in the New Kingdom, making it a very plausible candidate for Pithim. The discovery of granaries and storage pits at the site aligns with the biblical description of Pithim and Ramses as store cities, suggesting these were central to the Egyptian state's efforts to stockpile resources. Obviously, it wouldn't be on the list if there were alternative theories for this location. Some scholars have proposed different sites for Pithom based on variations in the interpretation of ancient texts and geographical considerations. These include locations such as Tel el Rataba and Tel el Daba in the eastern Nile Delta, with each of its own sets of archaeological findings and historical significance. But locating this city implies the historical accuracy of the Exodus narrative, which is up for debate. Some view the archaeological evidence as supportive of the biblical accounts, while others argue that the story is a later religious and cultural construct. The lack of direct Egyptian records mentioning the Israelites' enslavement or the construction of Pithom adds to the complexity, I will say, of the issue. What is interesting, though, however, is the identification of Pithom also plays into theories about the route of the Israelite exodus from Egypt. The location of Pithum, along with Ramses, is crucial for mapping the possible paths taken by the Israelites as they fled Egyptian bondage. Theories about the Exodus route vary widely, with some suggesting a northern path towards the Mediterranean coast and others advocating a more southerly route through the Sinai Peninsula. So, with that being said, we can't really find Pithum without accepting the historical accuracy of the Exodus narrative, which in and of itself is kind of hard to prove. But if we do take that, Tel El Mascuta remains the most credible identification for Pithim, so we'll just stop there. Number 12, Shambhala. Now, before somebody comes after me, it's also spelled Shambhala or Shambhala, but in the list it's Shambhala. So, with that being said, it is a mythical kingdom that has fascinated philosophers, explorers, and spiritual seekers and its origins can be traced back to ancient Buddhist texts where it is described as a land of peace, prosperity, and spiritual enlightenment. Unlike many other mythical places that are often considered as purely symbolic, Shambhala is believed to be a real location hidden from the modern world and accessible only to the pure of heart or those with a profound spiritual understanding. The concept of Shambhala has been incorporated into various cultural, religious, and mystical traditions, each adding to its own interpretations and lore, thus contributing to the mystique and variety of theories surrounding its location and nature. So with that, we'll kind of just go through and list a couple of the various theories about the location of Shambhala. 
Most traditional beliefs place Shambhala in a remote part of Inner Asia, often associated with the Himalayas. Tibetan Buddhism holds that Shambhala is physically located, but hidden, possibly in a valley surrounded by snow-capped mountains, accessible only through spiritual merit or karmic connection. Many interpretations of Shambhala suggest it is not a physical place, but a spiritual kingdom, accessible through meditation and spiritual practice, rather than physical travel. This view holds that Shambhala represents a state of enlightenment and inner peace that one can achieve regardless of their geographical location. And then there's also some esoteric teachings that propose Shambhala might be located in a different dimension or an underground realm, drawing parallels with other mythologies that speak of hidden worlds accessible through caves, tunnels, or portals. But to get away from the spiritual stuff, uh, some specific geographic locations have been suggested including parts of western Tibet or the Altai Mountains in Central Asia. These areas, known for their spiritual significance and isolated landscapes, do fit the descriptions of Shambhala's hidden nature. And of course, it has been tied with other mythical traditions, um, sometimes linked with places like Hyperborea, Agartha, or Atlantis even, suggesting a universal myth of a lost paradise or a hidden spiritual center existing across different cultures, which... You know, even if they are false, that kind of universal myth of a lost paradise is very intriguing to me. It reminds me of the universal myth of the flood stories, uh, but we've already talked about that, so won't bore you with that. Shamhala's lore is deeply embedded in Kala Chakra Tantra, an important text in Vajrayana Buddhism. The prophecy of Shamhala speaks of a future where the world is torn by war and greed, from which a righteous king of Shamhala will emerge to defeat the forces of evil and usher in a golden age of spirituality. This prophecy has inspired generations of spiritual seekers, as well as a number of historical figures, who have claimed to be connected to Shamhala, or to have received visions of its location. Which, I don't know if I'd be trusting leaders who claim that, but to each their own. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Western explorers and mystics became fascinated with the legend of Shamhala, leading to several expeditions attempting to locate the kingdom. Figures such as Nicholas Rorik, a Russian painter and mystic, undertook extensive travels in Central Asia, inspired by the search of Shambhala and contributing to the mythology surrounding it in Western esoteric thought. Obviously, he didn't find it, so moving on. Number 13, The Secret Gospel of Mark The Secret Gospel of Mark is a controversial and intriguing text within biblical scholarship and early Christian studies. Its existence came to light through a letter attributed to Clement of Alexandria, a theologian of the early Christian church, which was discovered by Morton Smith in 1958 at the Mar Sabah Monastery near Jerusalem. The letter mentions a more spiritual version of the Gospel of Mark, referred to as the Secret Gospel of Mark, which has said to contain additional teachings and episodes not found in the canonical Gospel of Mark. So, Morton Smith found the letter, which was written in Greek in the end papers of a 17th century book. According to Smith, this letter, supposedly from Clement of Alexandria to an individual named Theodore, discusses a longer, more mystical version of the Gospel of Mark. This version was allegedly kept secret and intended only for those initiated into deeper mysteries of the Christian faith. The letter quotes two passages supposedly from the secret Gospel of Mark. The most notable passage describes a miracle similar to the raising of Lazarus in the Gospel of John, involving a young man in a linen cloth whom Jesus raises from the dead. Obviously, since its discovery, the authenticity of the secret gospel and the Clement letter has been hotly debated among scholars. Some consider it a genuine ancient text that offers insight into the diversity of early Christian traditions and texts. Others, however, view it as a modern forgery, possibly even by Morton Smith himself. Citing the absence of the original manuscript for examination and the stylistic analyses that question its authenticity. If authentic, the secret gospel of Mark could suggest that early Christianity had a more diverse set of beliefs and texts than previously thought. It might indicate the existence of esoteric teachings within Christian communities, or a version of Mark's gospel that was adapted for a specific audience with advanced theological instruction. The letter's attribution to Clement of Alexandria, known for his attempts to reconcile Greek philosophy with Christian doctrine, adds another layer of complexity. It suggests that early Christian leaders might have engaged with secret traditions or that there were debates about which texts were suitable for public consumption and which were reserved for the initiated. 
text cited in the letter shares thematic and stylistic similarities with the canonical Gospel of Mark, but introduces elements that are more aligned with Gnostic or mystical traditions. This has led to discussions about the development of the Gospel text, the process of canonization, and the boundaries between orthodoxy and heresy in early Christianity. Number 14, the Fountain of Youth. The Fountain of Youth is a legendary spring that supposedly restores the youth of anyone who drinks or bathes in its waters. This myth has been around for centuries, and it has appeared in the writings of historians, explorers, and storytellers all around the world. Its origins can be traced back to ancient times, and over the centuries it has been linked to various locations across the globe. The concept of restorative waters can be found in several ancient cultures, including Greek, Persian, and even Indian mythology. Our favorite Greek historian Herodotus mentioned a fountain in the land of the Macrobians, which supposedly gave them exceptionally long lifespans. Legends also suggest that Alexander the Great searched for the water of life, encountering a healing river of immortality in his travels, but people have no reason to lie in history, right? Indigenous peoples of the Caribbean and Americas also had myths about waters with special properties, including a belief that the life-prolonging spring in the land of Bimini, which was later associated as the Fountain of Youth. And that brings us all the way to the Age of Exploration, where Juan Ponce de Leon, one of the most famous associations of the Fountain of Youth, claimed to have found it. Ponce de Leon was a Spanish explorer who, in the early 16th century, was rumored to be seeking the fountain in what is now Florida. Modern historians, however, suggest that this connection was a later addition to his story, popularized by 16th century writers to essentially discredit Ponce de Leon's accomplishments. Contemporary documents from his expedition have zero mention for any quest of magical waters. Which brings us to St. Augustine, a city founded by Spanish explorers in 1565, is home to the Fountain of Youth Archaeological Park, where a spring is claimed to be the elusive Fountain of Youth sought by Ponce de Leon. I've actually been here, and while it is more of a tourist attraction than a historically verified site, it definitely symbolizes the enduring appeal of the legend. There are some more alchemical and philosophical symbolism that I would like to touch on. In alchemy and various philosophical traditions, the Fountain of Youth represents the elixir of life, a metaphor for spiritual rebirth and enlightenment. This interpretation shifts the quest from a physical search to an inner journey of transformation. Do with that as you will. The Fountain of Youth also kind of parallels modern humanity's efforts to extend life, combat aging, and enhance health through medical and scientific advancements, and some other darker kind of stuff. I won't get into that, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Number 15, Gold Digging Ants. So this myth originates from ancient texts, most notably described by Herodotus again. According to Herodotus, there were giant ants in India that dug up gold while burrowing their mounds. See, it's stuff like this where I'm like, who were you talking to? Where did you come into contact with somebody that was like, yeah, there are these big ants and they gave me gold. I just, I don't get it. And then he has the audacity to put it, never mind. Again, according to Herodotus, there were giant ants in India that dug up gold while burrowing their mounds, and the local people would then collect the gold, making them extremely wealthy. He describes these creatures as being larger than a fox, but smaller than a dog, and these ants, according to him, would dig up gold from the sand in a region he associated with India, likely referring more broadly to areas east of the Persian Empire. The locals would then stealthily collect the gold, taking care to avoid the swift and dangerous ants. So the actual location described by Herodotus is obviously ambiguous, leading scholars to speculate that he was referring to regions in Central Asia, particularly parts of what is now Pakistan, Afghanistan, and even the Himalayas. Over time, various theories have proposed that the ants in question were actually marmots or, or other burrowing animals common to these areas, which could have been seen by travelers collecting gold from sand deposits. One prevailing theory suggests that Herodotus' account may be based on misunderstandings or exaggerations of secondhand reports. The term ant might have been a mistranslation or misinterpretation of the local word for another animal, such as the Himalayan marmot, known to burrow in gold-bearing sands. And then some interpretations suggest that the story could be metaphorical, representing the dangers and challenges of gold mining in remote and difficult terrains, or the wealth of the regions beyond the Persian Empire embellished through storytelling. Another theory states that ancient traders and travelers 
might have encountered local practices of collecting gold particles from river sands using the fur of animals like marmots. Observing these practices, they could have crafted the narrative of gold digging ants, blended observation with myth. But just from doing research from this, in my extremely unqualified opinion, I just think it was marmots. At least giant ants would be more terrifying and marmots would be less so. So, yeah. Number 16, Princess Tadukippa and Nefertiti. These are two figures from the ancient Near East whose lives have always been intertwined and have intrigued historians and archaeologists. Nefertiti is one of the most famous queens of ancient Egypt, known for her beauty and the mystery surrounding her reign and disappearance. Princess Tadu Kippa, on the other hand, is a lesser known figure, a princess from the Mitanni kingdom, who played a role in the diplomatic marriages that were common in the 14th century BC. And like I mentioned, there have been some speculative theories linking Tadu Kippa and Nefertiti, though these do remain unproven and are obviously subjects of debate. Nefertiti was the chief wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten, formerly Amenhotep IV, who reigned in the 14th century BC. She is best known from the iconic bust discovered in 1912 by the German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt, which is now housed in a museum in Berlin. Nefertiti and Akhenaten are noted for their religious revolution, wherein they promoted the worship of Aten, the sun disk, above all other gods, marking a significant departure from traditional Egyptian polytheism. Princess Tadokippa was the daughter of King Tushrata of Mitanni, a kingdom located in what is now northern Syria and southeastern Turkey. Her name comes to prominence through the Amarna Letters, a collection of diplomatic correspondences found in Egypt. One of these letters includes a message from Tushrata to Akhenaten, offering Tadokippa in marriage to strengthen the alliance between Egypt and Mitanni. This marriage took place in the context of complex diplomatic relations among the major powers of the ancient Near East, including Egypt, Mitanni, Babylon, and Assyria. Some theories speculate that Princess Tadokippa, upon marrying into the Egyptian royal family, could have become known as Nefertiti. This hypothesis suggests a transformation or renaming upon her integration into Egyptian society, a practice not unheard of in ancient times, especially with Akhenaten changing his name from Amenhotep. Proponents argue that this could explain some of the mystery surrounding Nefertiti's origins, as Egyptian records do not provide any details about her early life. The mainstream scholarly consensus does not support the theory that Tadokipa and Nefertiti are the same person. Historians and Egyptologists typically treat them as distinct individuals, each significant within their own cultural and historical contexts. In one of my previous videos, I did dive deeper into this theory, uh, I do think it's fascinating and in my opinion answers a lot of questions surrounding Queen Nefertiti, but apparently those answers aren't good enough for mainstream historians, and obviously they know a hell of a lot more than I do. Number 17, Talos of Crete. Talos of Crete is a fascinating figure from Greek mythology, embodying the ancient Greeks' blend of mythology, technology, and magic. Talos is often depicted as a giant bronze automaton or a living statue created by Hephaestus the god of blacksmiths and craftsmen, or by Daedalus, a skilled craftsman and inventor. The mythical guardian was tasked with protecting the island of Crete from invaders and pirates, circling the island's shores three times daily. Talos was given to Minos, the king of Crete, to act as a guardian of the island following his conquest. According to myth, Talos protected Crete by hurling rocks at approaching ships or invaders, preventing enemies from landing on the island. One of the most detailed accounts of Talos comes from Argonautica, an epic poem that describes the adventures of Jason and the Argonauts. One of the most detailed accounts of Talos comes from the Argonautica, an epic poem that describes the adventures of Jason and the Argonauts. In this narrative, Talos encounters the Argonauts during their quest for the Golden Fleece. The most famous story involving Talos is his defeat by the witch Medea, who accompanied Jason and the Argonauts. There are different versions of the story, but the most common tells of Medea deceiving or hypnotizing Talos and then removing a bronze nail from his body. According to mythology, this nail was crucial for his vitality. It kept the ichor, the divine fluid, served as the blood of the gods and immortals, within his body. Once the nail was removed, it all flowed out and Talos died, allowing the Argonauts safe passage. Talos is often cited as an example of the advanced technological concepts imagined by ancient Greeks, he can be seen as a precursor to modern robots and other automatons, showcasing the blend of technology and magic in Greek mythology. So the main mystery here is whether or not it existed, but there isn't really any evidence to suggest it did exist, but I do think it is interesting to show the Greek mindset and the ability for them to come up with all these crazy ideas that, you know, aren't too far from the truth nowadays. 
Number 18, the lost city of Thinis. The lost city of Thinis is a significant yet elusive site in ancient Egyptian history, believed to have been a powerful cultural and political center during the early dynastic period of ancient Egypt. Thinis is credited with being the hometown of the first kings of a unified Egypt, making it a key location in the country's formation and early development. Despite its importance in ancient Egyptian history and mythology, the exact location is still a mystery. So, Thinis played a crucial role in the early historical narratives of Egypt. It is often mentioned in ancient texts as the birthplace of Minis, the pharaoh who is traditionally credited with unifying Upper and Lower Egypt around 3100 BC. This unification marked the beginning of the Pharaonic Age and the First Dynasty of Egypt. The city was also significant in the religious landscape of ancient Egypt. It was associated with the worship of the deity Anhur, the god of war, and hunting, who was particularly venerated in this region. Archaeologists have sought to identify the location of Thinis for many years, with several sites in Upper Egypt, particularly near Abydos, being considered as possible candidates. Abydos itself was a major religious center and acropolis, suggesting a close connection between the two cities. Ancient texts and inscriptions, including those found in the tombs of early pharaohs and various historical records, reference Thinis, offering clues to its significance and location. However, these sources have not led to a definitive identification of the city's archaeological remains. One of the major challenges in locating Thinis is the possibility that it was overshadowed and absorbed by the expanding influence of Abydos and later Thebes, leading to its decline as a distinct urban center. Over time, the physical traces of Thinis may have been eroded or built over, complicating efforts to pinpoint its exact location. Some scholars speculate that Thinis may have served more as a symbolic or tribal center rather than a substantial urban settlement. Others argue for its more historical and political importance based on its frequent mention in ancient sources. The close association with Thinis and Abydos, where early kings were buried, supports theories that Thinis may have existed nearby, possibly serving as a political counterpart to Abydos, and honestly, in my opinion, was probably just built over in the expanding Abydos territory. Number 19. Bakaria Kanad Karya Kanad, also known as Kashyapa or Kanada or Kanada Muni, is a revered ancient Indian philosopher and sage credited with founding the Vaisheshika School of Indian Philosophy. He is recognized for his groundbreaking work on atomism and the nature of matter, making him one of the pioneers in the development of ideas that can be seen as the precursors to modern atomic theory. His contributions are primarily documented in his work the Vaisheshika Sutra, which he systematically laid out the principles of his philosophical system. Karya Kanad lived around the 6th century BC, according to traditional accounts, although exact dates vary among scholars. His period was one of intense philosophical development in India, with various thinkers contributing to the fields of metaphysics, ethics, and logic. This era saw the emergence of several philosophical schools, including Buddhism, Jainism, and other orthodox schools of thought. By Sheshika School, founded by Kanad, proposes a form of atomism that the universe is composed of indivisible eternal atoms. Kanad's philosophy is notable for its systematic classification of reality into categories including substance, quality, activity, generality, particularity, and inheritance. Among these, substances are further divided into nine classes, earth, water, light, wind, ether, time, space, soul, and mind. Atoms of earth, water, light, and wind are considered eternal and form the material world through various combinations. So the mystery here primarily revolve around the historical ambiguity of his life, the origins of his philosophical insights, and the influence of his teachings through time. While his contributions to Indian philosophy and the concept of atomism are well recognized, several aspects of his life and work remain speculative. One of the primary mysteries is the exact period during which he lived. Estimates vary widely with some sources placing him as early as the 6th century BC, and others suggesting a later period. This uncertainty complicates the task of understanding the specific historical context of his teachings and how they interacted with other contemporary philosophical developments. Much of what is known about him comes from later texts that reference his work, leading to a mix of mythological and factual interpretations of his life, with theories coming from he was a time traveler to it was a mix of a group of people that came up with the ideas and a lot of it takes away the credit from him. Even though we don't know when he lived, the contributions to modern society is amazing. And finally, number 20, the Kingdom of Uratu. It is often just referred to as the Lost Kingdom and flourished between the 9th and the 6th centuries BC in the region corresponding to modern-day Armenia, eastern Turkey, and northwestern Iran. 
Renowned for its advanced metallurgy, agriculture, and impressive fortresses, Urartu played a significant role in the ancient Near East geopolitical landscape before its decline and eventual absorption by the Medes and later by the Achaemenid Empire. Despite its historical significance, many aspects of the Uratarian civilization remain a mystery, largely due to the limited archaeological excavations and the decipherment of their inscriptions only in the 19th and 20th centuries. Urartu emerged in the 9th century BC, reaching its zenith under kings like Argishti I and Sardari II, who expanded its territory and established a formidable kingdom characterized by strong fortresses, advanced irrigation systems, and a centralized administration. The capital, Tushpa, was a political and religious center, showcasing the kingdom's architectural and artistic achievements. The origins of the people and their ethnic and linguistic affiliations are subjects of ongoing research. While their inscriptions are written in an Assyrian cuneiform script, the Urartian language itself is related to Urian, and its precise relation to other languages and cultures in the region is still being explored. The rapid decline of Urartu by the end of the 6th century BC following the expansion of the Medes and later the Persians, is a significant mystery. The exact reasons for its fall, whether due to invasion, internal strife, or other factors, are not fully understood, and the transition from Urartian to Armenian dominance in the region is also a complex process that is not fully documented or understood. But yeah, surprisingly, we don't know much about who these people were or how their empire came to its downfall. Well, that about wraps up Tier 1 of Ancient Mysteries Volume 3, you enjoyed don't forget to click the like button and subscribe if you haven't already if you made it this far i really do appreciate you watching it means a lot to me and i definitely appreciate my patrons jacob ziegler dr swag drew Singal, dates and dead guys jag and bean fart and ganja girl i hope you all enjoyed and we'll see you in the next episode